to Genesis 1. Genesis 1. Um, you ready to get to work? Yes? I know I have my tea in here and I'm not supposed to. I'm sorry. Don't, uh, I would say don't judge me, but you're at church. <laughs> Ooh, it's not gonna happen. Um, hey, Genesis 1, last week we started a new series on work, yeah. Here's the plan for tonight. I want to look at the exact same passages as last week and go deeper. One of the things I love about the Bible is there are layers, uh, meaning you can keep digging and digging and digging deeper and deeper and keep finding more and more. And that's the way the Bible works. And my goal with the next few minutes is to unearth a few things in the text that have been buried for way too long. That said, Genesis 1, let's start off in 26. Here we go. Then God said, let us make mankind or human in our what? Image. In our likeness so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own what? Image In the image of God who created them, male and female, he created them. What does that mean? To be made in God's image or likeness. In the ancient Near East, kings would set up images, or in today's language, statues, in the far reaches of the kingdom. And the images were made in the likeness of the king, meaning these statues looked like the king. But more than that, the images were used by the local governors who were co-ruling with the king, used by the local governors to get the king's will or laws done in the far reaches of the kingdom as it is in the capital. Humans are God's image bearers or God's representatives over the earth. There are two pieces to that reality. We reflect and we rule. Yes, we reflect, meaning we mirror back to God. We bear central aspects of what God is like in our DNA. God is a person. God is a worker. God is a creative. You are a person. You are a worker. You are a creative. But it's more than that. We are also called to rule. God says, let us make mankind our own image and our own likeness, so that they may what? Rule. Yes, rule over the earth. Now, remember. Rule in Hebrew is king language. It can be translated to rule or to reign or to have dominion. One Hebrew scholar I found translates the word rule, and I quote, as to actively partner with God in taking the world somewhere. I love that. What does that mean? That means from the beginning of the story, God has been looking for partners. And I'm intentional with the language of partners. The imagery in Genesis 1 and 2 is not of puppets on a string and God's up in the heavens playing, but of partners or image bearers or representatives, the word used in theology is co-regents or co-rulers, ruling with God over the earth. That's how God works. God could have chosen to make humans from the dust like he did with Adam, but instead he chose to work through who? You're like, not me, I'm single. Well, okay. <laughs> Humans, right? Through marriage and sexuality and family. God could have chosen to make bread fall from the sky like he did in the Exodus, but instead he chose to work through who? New seasons, right? Through <laughs> farmers and traders and merchants and agriculture and technology. Why? Because God is looking for partners. Let's keep reading. 28 says, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill, I hope the single people are like, I'm trying, give me a day. <laughs> Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky over every living creature that moves on the ground. In theology, verse 28 is called the cultural mandate or the creation mandate. Um, and put simply, it's human's first job description. 
God creates Adam, or human, and says, okay, you are made in God's image to rule over the earth. Here's your job. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue, rule, or put in today's language, create culture. The cultural mandate breaks down into two parts. The first part is be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, which means make something of the social world. Make something out of people. And it means more than make babies. It's that. Get married, have sex, make babies, start families. But it's also creating schools and churches and social structures and institutions and governments and laws and languages and nations and ethnic cultures and tribes. Create, make stuff out of people. Make something out of the social world. The second part is subdue and rule, and means harness the natural world. Plant crops, build houses, design software, make lattes and mochas, create and compose music, make art out of the raw materials in the world, plan cities, build homes and bridges, pave roads, make stuff out of the world. Human's job is to take the world somewhere. Now, the case study is Genesis 2. Turn the page. Next chapter, Genesis 2, look down at 8. Now, the Lord God had planted a garden in the east. And the garden is a literal garden, but it's also a metaphor for creation as a whole and work in general. Planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food, meaning beauty and aesthetic and design are important to God and functionality, good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And now look at 10, a river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there it was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first is the Pishon. It winds through the entire land of Abalia, where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. Aromatic resin and onks are also there, in case you're interested. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris. It runs along the east side of Ashur. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. Now, how many of you reading that are like, I don't care? <laughs> Right, one of the paragraphs in the Bible that you're reading, and you're like, why is that there? Like four headwaters, and the gold of that land is good. Okay, thank you. And onks and aromatic, what is aromatic resin, right? And you're, and you're reading, why is that there? Actually, it's really important in the text. The author is saying, Eden is made up of raw materials. Eden is made up of trees and rivers. Now keep in mind, we live in the modern world disconnected from the environment. In the ancient Near East, trees and rivers are life. Think of oxygen, right? I mean, trees are where you get wood and fire and sources of energy and food and sustenance. Rivers, all ancient civilizations were on rivers because agriculture was connected to rivers and commerce and trade and economy and civilization and villages and learning and languages. All of that happens on rivers in the ancient Near East. Eden is trees and rivers and food and fruit and vegetables and gold and metals and minerals under the ground. Eden is pure potentiality. And God says, look at 15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to what? Work it and take care of it. Here's one definition of work from Tim Keller, who's one of my favorite teachers. He says, work is rearranging the raw materials of a particular domain to draw out its potential for the flourishing of who? Everyone. Not me, but everyone. Work is serving others. Rearranging the raw materials of a particular domain to draw out its potential for the flourishing of everyone. Where does he get that? He gets that from Genesis 2. In fact, the word work, God put Adam in the garden to work it, is abad in Hebrew, and it can be translated to cultivate, or to develop, or to draw out its potential. Here's what you have to understand. Next slide. 
The garden was dynamic, not static. Or put another way, the creation was a project, not a product. Not all neat and tiny, tidy with a bow, finished. No, the creation was a project in motion, meaning the garden was designed to go somewhere. When you think about the Garden of Eden, don't think of a public park with paths and palms and lawns, and God says, Adam, okay, here is a lawnmower and clippers. Go keep the garden nice. Which is kind of the imagery in a bunch of people's minds. Am I right? Um, think of a wild, and think instead of a wild, untamed wilderness. Hundreds of thousands of geographic square miles teeming with raw beauty and materials and energy and violence and potential. And God says, okay, Adam, it's wild, no civilization. Go make a world. Go make roads and build bridges and create cities and homes and culture and technology and science and medicine and art and beauty and food and cuisine. Go make something with the world. That is why when you get to the end of the story of the Bible, Revelation 21 and 22, last two chapters, and the author, John, talks about God's future for the earth. He talks about the day when Jesus returns, not to take everybody away from earth to heaven, that is flat out unbiblical theology, but to take heaven crashing into earth to put the world to right, resurrection, humans come back from the dead, the cosmos comes back from the dead, God makes the world new. We live here in a city called the New Jerusalem. Now, Revelation 21 and 22, when John writes about the New Jerusalem, he writes in Eden language. Blatant, no holes bar. He is clearly alluding back to the Genesis story. He talks about a tree of life right in the middle of the city. He talks about a river that flows right through the middle of the city. He says there's no more curse. He's saying the New Jerusalem is Eden all over again. But it's not. Eden was a garden. The New Jerusalem is a garden-like city. Why is that? I mean, if Jesus comes to put the world back together, if Jesus comes to fix the problem, why doesn't the story end in a garden? Why doesn't the story end with Genesis 2 all over again? Why? Because, next slide, the garden was never supposed to stay a garden. The garden was always supposed to become a garden-like city. Take that. <laughs> now, in between Genesis 1 and 2 and Revelation, 21 and 22, there's a whole bunch of Bible. Am I right? What happens in Genesis 3? Yeah, in theology, it's called the fall. In layman's term, Adam screws up. Thank you very much, right? If you were to take sin out of the story of the Bible, you would be left with a pamphlet. Right? Genesis 1 and 2 and Revelation 21 and 22. But sin screws up the human story. Now, in Genesis 3 and past, we have a serious problem. Because the world is wild and needs taming. The world is chaotic and needs order. The world needs ruling. And whose job is it to rule over the earth? Yeah, human's job, my job, your job. But human is broken. Human is out of sync with God. In certain cases, human is flat out at war with God. And now instead of doing what the scriptures clearly teach, in spite of hyper-conservative modern Republicans, the scriptures clear, not that I'm biased, I'm sorry, <laughs> clearly teach humans' job is to work the earth and take care of the earth. Genesis chapter 2, 15, one of the first things we learn. But in spite of that, now human is abusing the earth. And the root issue is not oil. The root issue is human. We are broken and in need of saving, which is why Jesus comes. Jesus comes to put human back right with God. Jesus does what Adam was supposed to do. Jesus rules. He's called the Messiah or the King of the world or the ruler. The gospel in one sentence is Jesus is what? Lord. Jesus' message is the inbreaking of God's kingdom, God's rule and reign over the earth in and through a human called Jesus. Jesus is putting the world back together again, one human at a time. Now, turn over to Matthew 28, really fast. Turn to the right of your Bibles to Matthew 28, and let's read the last words of Jesus. Last words of Jesus, Matthew 28, 
And the last words, I think, tell the story. And in Matthew 28, if you look at verse 16, then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him. Some doubted Then Jesus came to them and said, and I quote, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, which is how you say Jesus is Lord in the first person. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey Everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Theologians point out the parallels between the cultural mandate in Genesis 1, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and do and rule, and what is called the Great Commission right here in Matthew 28, go, make disciples of all nations. Or in Mark, Jesus says, go into all the world and preach the, what? Gospel. And, and theologians argue G, what Jesus is doing here is rephrasing the original cultural mandate in light of sin and in light of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Meaning what? Meaning now, as followers of Jesus, we have a dual vocation. Now remember from last week, what does the word vocation mean? Calling, right? We have a dual vocation, meaning we have two callings from God. We have the original one, to create culture, to make something of the world, to go make stuff with your hands, with your mind, with your job, with computers, with your imagination, with family, with whatever, to go make something of the world and create culture. And now we have a secondary vocation and calling that falls on every single man or woman who follows, follows Jesus to make disciples and preach the gospel and help people come back into contact with the creator God. And it's a both and. The majority of people want to pick one, am I right? Some people are hyper-passionate about work and what they do and work hard and have a lazy phone, but when's the last time you shared Jesus with coworkers or customers or people you come in contact with? Um, I don't know. I work hard and figure people will get it, maybe, kind of, sort of. Other people are the opposite. Other people are hyper-passionate about the gospel and coworkers and people on the street and friends and neighbors who don't know Jesus, but you are a lousy employee. I mean, straight up. You know the dude who's like getting paid to manage accounts in the cubicle and instead he's reading his Bible? <laughs> to clarify, that's not godly, right? If Jesus were there, and he is, he would, he would be saying, get back to work. And he's into the Bible. From what I understand, he like is the author, right? But, but he's not into people stealing from employers by not working when you weren't even paid to work. There's a word for that, stealing. And, and we all know how Jesus feels about stealing, right? Like both are important to God. I mean, my prayer is that you would live as a missionary everywhere you go. Whether you go to Africa, or we prayed over a couple this morning going to um, Cambodia, or whether you go to PSU, or Barista, or Pete's, or the job site, or OHSU, wherever you work, do school, do life, you are a missionary, you are sent by God with the gospel. And my prayer is that you would be the best employees in the city of Portland. I dream of the day when companies come to churches in the city, knock on the door and say, do you have anybody who's out of work? Because followers of Jesus are the best employers we have and best employees we have. I mean, you are the people who show up early, stay late, smile on your face, good attitude. You don't gossip. You don't critique. You are responsible. You get the job done. You don't screw around when you're at work. You work hard. Seriously, where are all the followers of Jesus? I want to hire somebody, right? You're like, you're an idealist, aren't you? I know. I'm sorry. But I dream of that today. When that is the reputation of people who follow Jesus, when people like you and me buy into the dual vocation to create culture and to make disciples. Now, that said, I'm going to bring out five of my friends who are doing just that. Come on up. And uh, my friends are not public speakers per se, but uh, how about a bit of love for my friends? Take a seat. And uh, here's, here's the thing in the next 20 minutes. I want to take all the theology of the last two weeks, partner with God to take the world somewhere, blah, blah, blah. What does that actually mean? And I want to put flesh and blood on it for you to my friends. 
who are doing just that, who are in a vocation. Remember last week, we said a vocation is a calling from God to work that one. Anybody remember? No. Okay. <laughs> That's not a healthy sign on my teaching. Calling from God to work that one fits 